Hi, and welcome to Lights of the Roundtable. My name is Susanna, and I have Larry Ballard back. Now, Larry has been on our show before, and it all started with a near-death experience he had many, many years ago. That And God gave him a, a revelation of what's happening to our world right now. And he's back this time to talk about the global reset. Uh, Larry, welcome back. How are you, sir? Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, you take the floor. I know I started last week when we were talking about BRICS. We were talking about the rise and fall of China, how BRICS, BRICS came to the picture. And now we're talking about the Great Reset. And we know that the Great Reset, there's two players going on. The cabals, which is the bankers, the, the Cloud Schwab's one. And then the other reset, which is the, the quantum financial reset that is being championed by the white hats and well that's going on behind the scenes and you i'll let you explain it all but thank you for coming <laughs> yeah go ahead you take you take the floor sir all right maybe a summary for those who don't know what BRICS is let's review real quick BRICS is a five nation coalition that's attempting to dethrone the united states as the sole world's reserve currency and they want to basically be able to allow nations to buy oil and other internationally traded commodities using other than the U.S. dollars. And BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So that coalition has existed for two years, but it didn't have teeth until the last few months when Saudi Arabia, frustrated with Mr. Biden's policies, aligned itself with BRICS and said, guess what, folks, we're willing to to trade our oil in something other than U.S. dollars. And that has caused a cascade that's going to accelerate the process of coming in to the financial reset. So what do I see as the process that is now collapsing the global financial system? Something that's never happened before. We've had depressions, but in my lifetime, we have not seen a total collapse of the global financial system. So what's happening? There's a formula that they use. When they want to take us into to financial distress, they increase the money supply. Well, they've mm -hmm. never increased the money supply nearly to what they have done now because with COVID, every nation in the world printed money to nauseam, and the nations are up to their noses in debt. And now the United States comes in, and what they typically do, they're part of the globalist economy, is they target us at, at an investment. They basically expand the bubble and we go into deep, deep, deep debt. And at the final end, they draw back the credit. So where the global elite are now, the bankers, the, the, the Fed, are basically increasing the interest rates. And that's what's driving this collapse process. So the U.S. is consistently raising its interest rates now. And the other nations of the world, since they're not the global financial system of the world, are not able to absorb those increases in interest rate. So their currencies are devaluing, and I'll give you two current two examples. Britain, within the last couple of months, just barely missed collapsing. They had to bail out their bond system, and Japan had the same thing happen. So let's use Japan as an example of what's happening to nations all around the world. Their currency is devalued 40% in the last couple of months. What that means is that every time they have to go out and trade their currency for U.S. dollars in order to buy oil, it's costing them 40% more. Now, what does that do? That creates a situation where they have to take the money that they have in reserve in the form of our U.S. Treasury notes, and they have to sell them off. And as they sell them off, other nations sell them off, that what's happening is that it's now completing that cycle because now massive amounts of dollars are flowing back to the U.S. And as that completes the cycle, then the U.S. dollar begins to devalue and when the U.S. dollar devalues significantly enough, then we're going to have the collapse. And we're also going to see, as we talked about in the previous segment, China collapse. So stop and think, folks, what's going to happen catastrophically to the global financial system if China collapses and the United States collapse? That's going to take us into a situation where we've never, ever, ever been before. So, Zana, let me stop and let you interject at this point, and then we'll, we'll move on. You know, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, and I just wanted to mention that um, uh, not only has Saudi Arabia entered into the BRICS 
But I also uh, just got off a podcast and Germany is also joining the BRICS. So we have not only now Saudi Arabia, Argentina, I think United States behind the doors, I've heard something like that, but even Germany now is uh, joining the BRICS. So I think it's wonderful what's happening because it is true. I, I heard that our actual dollar value right now is three cents. The actual value of our dollar is equivalent to three cents. So what does that tell you? <laughs> well, let's go back because we talked about not only the United States falling, but we talked about China falling. So let's stop a moment and see what's causing it. So we talked about the United States. We had the graphic up a second ago. Mm -hmm. And basically it's the cycle where money is flowing back into the United States, devaluing in the final analysis the U.S. dollar. So if I sum up what BRICS is about, the nations of the world, Many, many of the most powerful nations in the world are saying to us, through BRICS, we no longer want to be controlled by the U.S. dollar. We no longer want to have to buy U.S. dollars in order to trade internationally. And so they want to say, we don't want to be controlled by you. We want to be sanctioned. We don't want to be controlled by the SWIFT system. But on the other side of the equation, this is why I said China's going to fall. We're seeing mass protests around the world against China. We're seeing it in Brazil, we're seeing it in Argentina, we're seeing it in in China itself. And for the first time, people are having the nerve to stand up and not only protest across the nation, but to say, we want the CCP to collapse, we want J.C. Ping to fall. So there are millions of people around the world that are saying, not only are we fed up with the United States and its control of us through its currency, but we're fed up with China. China has been proven to be a pariah nation and China has lost its control of the global financial system, or the global trade system, I should say. And so now corporations around the world are making provisions to pull away. It may take a year or two years or three years. But a notable example is Foxconn with Apple's largest production facility in China with 100,000 people employed at that one facility are now looking to India and Florida nations to take their their manufacturing of the iPhone out of China. That is happening with multiple nations. So not only is the United States in trouble and going to collapse, but so is China. And if those two nations collapse, that is going to collapse the entire financial system of the world. Wow. And so maybe let, let you interject again and we'll move on. No, I just want to know. So what? So once that happens, then what's next? What do you foresee? Well, people are going to flee from a falling currency. We've got inflation going on. Yeah. But basically, we're reaching a point where the fiat currency is at the end of its road. And once people see that, they're going to do what they've always done. They're going to run to go. They're going to flee fiat currencies and run to things that have intrinsic value. The first thing you're going to run to is gold. Now, the next thing I'm going to say is going to surprise you. They're going to run to silver. The silver is undervalued right now significantly compared to gold. However, I would say this to your audience. If you believe what we're saying in this video, then you need to act now, sooner than later. Because when this exodus from fiat currency moves, it's going to go to gold. But when it goes to silver, we're going to get a surprise. If we go back, Several years into the, I think it was 1989, the Hunt brothers, two brothers, almost solely captured control of the silver market. So when the global elite, the, the whales, see that, that this is taking place, it's only going to take a couple of the whales to come in and they'll buy the silver. So the silver is not going to be available once this collapse starts to happen. So gold is too big for them to control. The gold will still be there for us to buy. But my advice to those who believe that this is going to happen is if you don't have silver and you want to get into precious metals, do it now. So what happens after that? Then there are those who, who believe, and I think rightly so, that when the fiat system collapses, the intent of the global elite is to take us to a digital currency. And the digital currency that first great down, um, garnered control was Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. Bitcoin really has no functionality. 
but it basically is decentralized. So some people are going to run to Bitcoin, but I do not personally believe that's the big play in cryptocurrencies. I believe the big play is XRP. And I know, since Suzanne, that that's something that you know a lot about. So I'll stop in a second and let you comment. I think XRP is going to be the winner for a couple of reasons. One, anytime a new technology comes out, the global elite want to capture it and get control of it. But something interesting is happening with XRP, which is why we have the lawsuit going on with the SEC. XRP, the Ripple, Ripple, the corporation, does not owe any debt. They have not put any commercial paper out. What does that mean? It means the elite do not currently have control of Ripple. That's why they're trying to slow things down with XRP, because they want to garner control. That's why the SEC lawsuit is going on. But I believe that that lawsuit is just smoke and mirrors, because if you look at the number of agreements that have been signed around the world with XRP, it is absolutely clear that we are going to move to digital currency, and the digital currency that has the utility to replace SWIFT is XRP. So basically, I believe we're going to move to XRP, and when that happens, XRP, a 30 or 40 percent, a 30 or 40 cent purchase might make you extremely, extremely rich. So the, the, the remaining play into cryptos is in the ISO compliant coins. But anyway, let me stop because I know you know an awful lot about this <laughs> about this topic. <laughs> well, what do you want me to add? That the that the actually the second it, all of that the uh, lawsuit was settled a year and a half ago. Then it was back in October 2021, but it has not come out to light, as far as uh, mm -hmm. as I know of yet. But yes, the movie's playing on, and I know it's a it, it's more for institutions. The XRP is an institutionalized uh, token. Uh, it's not going to be a quote unquote coin like people think. And from what I understand or comprehend is that uh, for those that want to keep it, there's going to be a buyout at some point uh, because it's not for us little people to have it. But the buyout is going to be incredible when it comes and we'll have to just give it up. Um, I also do agree that silver is going to go up. We know there's bountiful, there's there's abundance of water, there's abundance of gold in our world. You know, that's what we we are. But when it comes to silver, it's uh, it's a metal that is not as abundant. Therefore, I always question the how much would it be worth? Would it be worth more than gold since we have less silver? So we'll see what happens. But I know that it's going to shock the world. I think it's selling right now at 20 bucks, 21 dollars, something like that an ounce. What was it on the com? I, I thought I saw it yesterday. I don't know. Twenty one. But anyways. I hear that it could go way up to the thousands. So um, yeah, there is the commodities and the price and the metal and the precious metals market is is moving. It it has its rocks. But what can I say? I think that the crypto market, when it comes to the ISO, to the stable coins and the ISO to uh, twenty two hundred and twenty two. I I don't know if it's twenty zero twenty twenty two. Sorry, um, those will all come to fruition and those are the ones that are going to be worth a lot and they're asset backed um so yeah so we'll see what happens but i think that um i don't know about you larry when it comes to the rv to the revaluation re of foreign currencies um and to gold and silver i don't know if everything's going to be immediately happening or i have a feeling that maybe crypto will start breaking away before we see the gold and the silver and the RV. That's the sense I got from talking to various sources, but I don't know. We'll see. It's it's a speculative game right at the most at this point. So we'll see. <laughs> it's speculative, but there's some there's some foundation. If we look at XRP, 38 of the largest banks in the world are already committed to that technology. Uh, the bank, the central bank of England is committed to that technology. Most of the European Union is committed to that technology. With that many players committed, there is no question that the global elite intend to take us into a cryptocurrency and the medium of exchange is going to be XRP. Now, here's where we differ from the global, from the financial elites plan. What they plan is that we go full blown into digital currencies and then they impose 
a central bank digital currency like they have in China, and that basically takes us into the B system, where we're told what we can buy and what we can't buy, where our currency evaporates if we don't spend it fast enough. But what I'm seeing, what God has shown me, is that's not what can happen now. The global elite have gotten ahead of themselves. Will that happen? Yes, when we get further into the book of Revelation. But for right now, what God has shown me is that this cryptocurrency and the other precious metals are going to be used to transfer wealth from the wicked to the righteous because in my opinion, based on the research I've done, the banking system is going to fail. And let me give you three or four reasons why. So one thing is the Rothschilds long, long time ago discovered that it was far more profitable to loan money to countries than individuals. Why? Because they can bankrupt the country, print their currency, and say, you will pay us interest for perpetuity. But now we're seeing entire countries on the verge of collapse. So as we see a domino of countries collapsing, that's where a huge stockpile of global elite's money is at. And something else we're seeing that we've never seen before. Whenever we had one of these collapses, we always ended up bailing the banks out. And I don't think that's going to happen this time. Part of the reason is every time a disclosure is made that discloses a global corporation as being the enemy of the people, their stocks fall. So we look at Disney, we look at, we look at the media, we look at the pharmaceutical industries. That's the second place that they have a huge amount of their money. When this comes down and full disclosure has occurred, I believe that there's going to be a bloodbath in the stock market where the global elite have their money set. And then we go into two other things. Uh, the banking system is not what most people think it is. We got frac fractional reserve currencies. So basically what happens is a bank takes your money, and most people don't know that the minute you deposit that money in the bank, it's no longer yours. It's the bank's. And the bank loans 90% of that out. They only have to keep 10%. So think about this. If we've got entire countries collapsing, if we've got massive global corporations collapsing, are they going to get into a situation where their 10% that they have is not enough? And that takes us, Suzanne, to a clip that I want to have you look at, which is forecasting that the, the FDIC has about 1% of the amount of money it needs in order to cover a banking run. And so I'd like you to take a look at that, and then we can talk up a, a bit of a bit of that later on. But I think your audience will find it extremely scary that there is not enough money to cover us in the event that what I have just outlined occurs. So again, let me stop and let you comment because I know this is also something you know. So how much of the 5.7 trillion in other assets could be those speculative derivatives? We already know that banks generate more than 52% or 50% of their income through trading. But let's just take a look at how much is in that fund to protect the other, that, what, what did I say that was? 9.2 trillion, 9.9 .9 trillion. How much is in there to ensure that? Let's take a look. This is the deposit insurance fund balance, also known as the DIF and these are the insured deposits. So there's your 9.9 .9 trillion, but oh my goodness, they only have 124.458 billion to insure 9.9 .9 trillion. Does that seem about right to you? No, that's 0.0126 pennies for every a dollar insured dollar. So that means that as long as only one bank and they go down in an orderly fashion, okay, you're not going to know it. But if there is indeed a real crisis in a lot of those big banks, you saw the four big insured banks, they go down at once, you, my friends, will notice because they're not going to be able to give you that money. And they were one small bank failure away after 2008, 2009, one small bank failure away from the whole world knowing that they were out of money. They're insuring 9.9 .9 trillion. How are they going to do that with 124 billion? Well, 
Why do you want me to comment, really, Larry? You're saying it all. <laughs> I have to concur. I, I just think that um, there's a lot going on, Larry. And the, the implosion of the banksters, like I call them and many others do, is becoming more and more evident. I know that, for example, like you mentioned, stocks like the Amazon and Disney, those stocks, I mean, I don't think Amazon is worth, what, half of what it was before Netflix. Um, there's all these big conglomerates that are just, um, yeah, it's going to be a surprise for everybody when they fall. And like you said, it's not going to be rescued. And that's why BRICS is working. And that's why I think that um, behind the scenes, if you read the newspapers, well, not newspapers, but the internet, and if you read like the projects that Ripple is in, in or the Stellar Network is in, and the deals are doing with projects and banks and institutions and everything, you start seeing a different picture. They're actually, I mean, the old system is collapsing because you see these banks, like the Bank of England, is going to is going to start minting their own digital coin. Like the country of Spain, they're already going to start doing their own sovereign digital peseta. The same thing with Italy. So if people are just paying a little bit of attention, I think that they can see behind this the, the shadows that things are brewing and they're not quite sure what it is. But that's why we have you and you're going to give us some more insights of what you think <laughs> we're all going to end up. Because the economies, if, they, if we all implode, it means that we all have to rise up. And how? I'm going to leave that to you. Before I get into that, you just triggered something else I'm going to say. Right now, in order to use the SWIFT system and to use the U.S. reserve currency to transfer money around the world, there has to be a huge amount of money that's kept within the banking system. I think that amount is $27 trillion that gives liquidity to the transfer from nation to nation. Think about this. What happens to that pool of liquidity when all of a sudden the U.S. Treasury notes are called in and China collapses and America collapses? That liquidity dissolves. That's what creates that run away from fiat currency. So when that happens, either one of two things is going to happen. The entire financial global system is going to come to a catastrophic halt, or there has to be something that rescues it. So what is it that I believe will rescue it? It's XRP. XRP is going to give liquidity to the market, and it's going to be able to rescue the global financial system. It is so much more efficient than SWIFT that it's not funny. SWIFT can take three to five days to transfer money. It's very expensive. It's very data poor. XRP is very data rich. You can even do smart contracts with it. It costs a fraction of the amount. It transfers much faster. And the currents and XRP functions differently than a fiat currency or normal crypto, where if you print more money, then the money devalues. But in this instance, the more of the market share of SWIFT that XRP takes, the more value is going to go into XRP and the higher its price is going to be. So XRP is going to be the inverse of the fiat system, and it's going to be what rescues us from this financial collapse and creates the opportunity for a comeback. And that comeback, I believe, is going to come from America. When China collapses, it has so many things that are pressing against it that it will not be, rise back up again as a global superpower. I believe it will be a regional superpower, but the United States will benefit greatly from nations leaving. India will benefit. Other nations will benefit. America will be the phoenix that rises to save. Now, I want to take you into history and to some insights from God. So we've talked about this, and now I'm going to lay the bombshell on you. What is likely to be, in my opinion, the new financial system? It's far more than just XRP. It is a total retooling of the entire global economic system. Think about this. Where the nations of the world have gotten into debt is that China, which is the, just a redo of the British free trade system that created goods that were so cheap that other nations couldn't compete against them. And those nations were de, de industrialized and driven into debt. So that's what China's done to us. 
So that's the core root of what's caused this financial crisis that we have. So what's the inverse of that? So China makes products that have planned obsolescence so that we have to buy again and again and again and consume more and more resources. And what do the global elite tell us? We have a resource consumption problem. So what's the answer? The answer rests in American history and in what I believe to be God's plan. Way back, immediately following the Civil War, America began a monumental skyrocket rise in power and in finance. It created the uh, transcontinental railroad system and exported it to Europe. It created the Industrial Revolution and exported that technology to Europe. And the whole world was rising in terms of the standard of living. It was called the American Economic System. And it was referred to by Lincoln as the only system in the history of the world that equalized well elevated all mankind. So it's that disproportionate income level and the, the strife that occurs in nations that causes wars. If we can create a system that equalizes and elevates all mankind, the cause of war is gone. We're going to be able to do amazing things. So here's what I see. I see the American economic system is coming back. I've given it a new name. I call it equalitarianism. It's the system that is going to say that as we leave China, our tooling is going to have to be redone for our manufacturing. We're going to have the opportunity to tool products that are designed to last as long as humanly possible. And that is going to dramatically affect our resource consumption in a positive way. And basically, we're going to be able to move into an entirely new kind of an economy. We're going to have an economy where nations cooperate, where things are designed to have longevity and reusability, where we have a deglobalization occurring, where, where the manufacturing is leaving China, is going to multiple different countries around the world so that no one nation can control the money supply, no one nation can control trade, and basically, we all are forced to cooperate. So what I see happening is instead of having finished goods shipped out of China all around the world, the people in Africa and other resource-rich nations are going to get together and do something like what OPEC did. What they're going to say is, you can't make those finished goods without our natural resources. So we're going to have a new game in town. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, we will cooperate with you if you cooperate with us. And what I see is deglobalization, where we have stockpiles of natural resources backed by cooperative agreements between nations. And then the technologically advanced nations will build development centers around those resources. And basically all the nations of the world will have an, an opportunity to participate in a new financial system. They'll be able to control natural resources, manufacturing, trade, and money. So everybody will have skin in the game. And what that will do is that will change the world. That will take us into what I believe God is ushering in now, and into the latter day reign, into God's harvest, into a time where we're going to have unparalleled peace, where we're going to be able to, to dethrone the CIA, the military industrial complex, where we're going to be able to, to basically turn the entire economic system of the world upside down into a fair, more just system. And when that happens, as we were talking earlier, the banks are going to fail. Four big banks, in my opinion, are going to fail. And as they come down, that's going to be the cascade that causes this whole process to regen. And I want the audience to think about it. What a wonderful world it would be if we were no longer put into slavery by the global financial elite if everybody had an opportunity to have a decent standard of living, and that takes us into Masara. And I want to tell you a little bit of history about Masara. Most people don't know that it's been on the table for a long, long time. And a lot of people don't even know what it is. But I want to take you back to 1963. In 1963, Kennedy was assassinated. And all these years later, decades later, they still will not release all the information about that about that assassination. So I'm going to bring forward a couple of things for the audience to think about. Here's what was happening. Kennedy was coming against the Fed. He had actually printed several certificates and was going to get rid of the Fed. 
He was coming against the CIA and FBI and saying that they were traitors. He was not willing to to send more troops into Vietnam, so he was coming against the military and against the complex. But there was one more thing that was in the mix. He was trying to implement Nassara. When he collapsed the Fed, he was going to implement Nassara and take us into the very scenario that we're talking about right now. So it's been from 1963 till now that people have been behind the scenes, as you and I call them, with white hats, undoing the global financial elite system, bringing the mega banks down, bringing the mega corporations down, and creating an opportunity where we can have a period of peace on earth, where people cooperate, where we can address the issues that are really hurting us. We talk about maybe we move forward to, to the green movement, which is a bunch of bunk. Basically, we have climate issues. Yes, we do, but they're not caused by carbon. They're caused by something else. But the matter of fact, if I go back far enough, the time in the history of the world when everything was the most prolific was during the dinosaurs, when there were hundreds of volcanoes erupting, 300 times more carbon in the atmosphere, yet the plants were bigger, the animals were bigger, everything was bitter. So here's what NASA has told us. NASA accidentally told us the truth behind climate change. They said that we know with our telescopes and our instruments that every planet in our solar system is having similar climatic changes to the, to the Earth. The temperature is rising proportionally. So what does that tell us? It's not something that's emanating from Earth. It's emanating from the solar system. It's emanating from the sun. And we know from past history that when we're at a particular point in the solar system, there is increased gravitational pull. And right now, we're in the middle of a 15 million mile um, black hole that's causing an in increased gravitational pull on the Earth, causing increased sunspot activity. And when there's less sun sunspot activity, temperature cools. When there's more sunspot activity, the temperature heats. So there's a, a plausible reason for why we're having the warming cycles that we're having, but it goes beyond that. That is controllable. That's not nearly as catastrophic as we think it is because we have something called HARP. And in 1970, America entered into, that's this, a treaty with Russia. And that treaty said that we would not use something called HARP as a weapon of war across borders. And so what HARP is, is a technology that controls weather. It can cause earthquakes, it can cause hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, so the global elite want to control all the necessities of life and bring us into a point where we just say we surrender. So what I want the people to know is it's not what you think it is. Art can be used if once we get control of the system, it can be used to benefit mankind, not to harm mankind. And we're going to be able to solve the problems that we have relating to the climate. And the biggest one is not carbon. It's a shortage of water. And there's some 600 patents that have been shelved that I believe under Nassara are going to be released. And there are a couple of them that are going to dramatically increase our capability to desalinate water cost effectively. And when we do that, we're going to be able to regreen the desert for the world. And the Bible tells us that exact thing is going to happen. Israel has already done it. And the nation in the world, the only nation that does not have a single river at all is Saudi Arabia. And they have done some amazing things with water conservation and with desalination. And they have now gotten to the point that they are exporting food instead of importing food. And if they can do it with not a single river, we can do it. We can re-green the earth. So the story that they're telling us is absolutely a lie. There is plenty of water. We just have to manage it correctly. The hydraulic system of the planet has not changed. It's just that we're consuming water faster than the, the system can replenish it, but there are answers and things that we can do. With that, I want to stop again and invite you to interject because I can talk forever. <laughs> Thanks so much for, the, for giving me the floor. I just wanted to go back a little bit. <laughs> you're, you're wonderful, Larry, because you're on a roll. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, I don't know if you heard, but the money uh, that JFK produced at that time. I don't know if you heard the 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 rainbow monetary that the rainbow uh, money currency is coming. 
And that actually has to do with uh, what JFK did. So when we speak about the rainbow currency coming, it, it has already happened. This was already printed and it was money printed that JFK had um, programmed at that time and it never came to fruition. So I just wanted to make sure. And, and actually, when if I recall history, you know, we are asset backed um, gold. But if I correct, if I if I remember correctly, sorry, my, my brain is a little bit slow here today, is that he was going to back us uh, from silver. It was not gold backed mm -hmm. asset, but it was silver, which is, mm -hmm. again, interesting because, you know, when you talk about Nassara Gisera, we're all going into the gold asset backed system right we, our, our currencies are going to be asset backed by whatever but it's it for the most is going to be gold and it's interesting how few are, are asset backed by silver but anyways i just wanted to make a comment on that one um and yes i think that um well there's a lot of there's gonna be a lot of changes and with that said i think you hit right spot on a lot of things resources natural resources i know the water is one of them i know the climate change is Actually, I was going to say garbage. Gra we produce more garbage. <laughs> we produce so much garbage that that if anybody is concerned about that, you know, all those left wing people, you know, why buy why buy your iPhones from China? I mean, you think about the carbon footprint. You know, whenever you buy anything, and and people don't realize those little details, you know, and the garbage that China has produced in other countries like India, Bangladesh. You know, their waters are polluted, like you said last time. And we forget all those tiny little things. But anyways, I think that, yes, I think the globalization is happening. We'll see the, the implosion. But I do want to ask you, you mentioned four banks. Four banks are coming down. What are those four banks, Larry? Well, they're the big four. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Bank of America. Yeah. Wells Fargo. It's Chase. And it's J.P. Morgan. So my advice is, if I'm right, Put your money in a smaller bank, put it in a regional bank, put it in a, in a savings loan, get it out of the big banks. And the other piece of advice is if you have a lot of money in the bank, put it in as many different banks as you can and get it out of the small banks because in all likelihood, those banks are going to fail, at least one of them, maybe all of them. And the if we talked about the FDIC system doesn't have enough money to absorb a collapse of that magnitude. But if you can find some small regional banks that are that, are, that have appropriately managed themselves, you're going to be better off. So that would be my advice in terms of the banking system. Yeah. Have you heard of Basel, Larry? The Basel no, particle? Not. All right. Because I was talking to some of the quantum seller initiatives because uh, there's a lot of, uh, Besides the XRP, there's XLM and, and XTC and Algo. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of stable cryptos that are asset backed and, and they're part of the institutions and ledgers and all sorts of things that are, that are just uh, coming th to fruition. Well, and they're in beta, beta mode. But Basel is, um, let me see. Let me just, let me see if I can find it over here on my notes. Because I know that the implementation of Basel went um, on January 1st, 2023, and it's a compliance that all banks must be asset back by the end of this year. And if they're not, they're going to fold because of what you just said. So, yeah. um, so it's a, so there is part of the reform, the banking reforms that are going on. And so uh, Basel 3 has been going on for about 10, 12 years. Basel 4 is right now, and it refers to the finalization of Basel 3 reform package, which has taken more than a decade to develop. And so basically it's changing the whole landscape of the banking system. So from what I understood the other day when I had the QSI team um, is that for those banks, they're going to fold by the end of the year if they're not compliant, and that means asset back. So let's tell our audience to be careful, do their homework, keep their eye on their monies, because there are some banks that may fold when the crash is done, they fold. 
they won't come again. But that doesn't mean that your money, you won't get your money back. I hear that there's a plan for that sort of uh, restoration uh, coming with it. But yes, and I've also heard that if you have any private little monies on your on stocks, you know, that are not IRA, like your if you have funds on ETFs or any sort of other type of, I don't know, hedge funds or anything, who wants to invest on hedge funds? But anyways, if you have anything on stocks, um, I've also been told that it's best to remove it and put you and spread your risks elsewhere. Because when that collapses, there's a lot of companies that are not going to make it through the collapse because of lack of liquidity, asset, lack of asset back and all that stuff. So there's a lot of commotion happening. So that's all I wanted to mention um, and to add a point because I know that things are happening and might happen pretty soon. I think you've taken me almost to the end of this, but you did jog another comment that I want to make. This collapse is, again, going to be different than other collapses. When we've had collapses before, what happens is the elite cause the rise in the value of the stock market or the housing market or whatever. So they own those assets. They have controlling interests of those, of the stock, of those companies, and they, they are own Fannie and Freddie. So they're making money as they're causing the moment to go up. Then it collapses. However, the system bails them out at the end, and so then they buy back. Those same assets that made a fortune on as the bowl went up, they buy them back for 10 cents on the dollar or whatever. This time, many of those corporations, which is what you're alluding to, are going to go under. So if people can find a place to park their money, you can put it into to precious metals, as we've been talking about, or crypto. You can also put it into anything that's, that's got real value, land, uh, uh, artwork, you know, whatever real estate, and then you can pull it out. And this time what's going to happen is you're going to see the survivors of the stock market, and we're going to be able to invest in those corporations. We're going to be able, especially if you've made some real money in the transfer of wealth through, through the crypto market, you're going to be able to come back in and, and have invest again in the, stock, in the stocks that are surviving. And then here's the one comment that I made. Look at the ones that are necessities, that are absolutely crucial in manufacturing products that have to do with food, that have to do with energy, because those stocks mandatorily must come back. So many of these others will come back over years, even decades, but stocks that are necessities for life will come rebounding back very fast. So with that, I think that's everything I have to say. Or she has something else to it to comment? Yeah, no, I think essentials is true. Essentials are the the things that are coming back. And just one more thing, um, there is a stellar ledger that people should look into it. Um, if you want to find out more on how you can um, start creating uh, generational wealth for fractions of pennies, uh, look into the stellar uh ledger there is a group that is trying to educate on um the opportunities and that is called the quantum stellar initiative and i'll tell you the seized assets that capitulated under trump those are being uploaded as we speak on a daily basis they're being valued and those are uploaded by the military the white hats as well as uh, sorts of uh, all sorts of commodities, a lot of the banks um, are there too, uh, and everything is asset backed, and it's a world of um, it's going to be a world in the future that's going to be transparent. It's going to be the people's ledger, and XRP is going to be for the institutions. And so there's a lot of opportunities, and if you want to take a look, just go there. So with that said, Larry, I don't know about you, but I thought that you gave some amazing insights of what's coming. You explain it beautifully. And all I can say is that at least we warn people to brace themselves because we are still not in the bumpy road and it's going to get a little worse before we see that collapse. And I think 2023 is going to be, apparently from what I hear, the year that we're going to collapse and the Phoenix rises. Well, Larry, we hope to see you again. 
I'm sure we can come up with other podcasts. You have a wealth of knowledge. Do come back. Thank you so much, sir. Have a good day, Susan.